Hello everyone, I'm Nat Colson, a photographic artist and fine art printmaker based in the UK. I'm going to demonstrate the Epson SureColor SCP900 and show you how to produce professional quality prints. I've worked in printing my entire career starting in the late 1980s. And as a photographer, I've been making fine art photographic prints for over 20 years now, having worked extensively with most of the Epson professional printer models during that time. As a working photographic artist, I produce and sell fine art prints as interior decor, so quality is my top concern. I own a gallery of fine art photography called Fotique, where we provide fine art printing services along with exhibiting the work of top international photographers. My inkjet printers have always been a key part of my art and my business. Epson printers have remained the best choice for my work and my clients. The latest models of printers from Epson truly produce the absolute best quality ever achievable in photographic inkjet printing. And though I'll be showing you the P900, it's important to note that most of what we're going to cover also applies equally to the SureColor SCP700 as well as many other inkjet printers. Making a fine print can be a very satisfying conclusion of our creative workflow. Especially in this age of digital media and the internet, a beautiful photographic print carries presence and impact like nothing else can. My main goal with these videos is to teach you all the most important things you need to know. The aim is to get you printing as quickly and as easily as possible while ensuring that your prints are as good as they can be right from the start. So if you're new to printing yourself, don't worry. I'll explain everything you need to know to get good results. And if you've been working with Epson or other printers for a while, some of this may seem familiar, but certainly we could all use a refresher and improve our workflow from time to time. So let's get started. While the printer itself requires very little desk space, you need some room to work for opening paper boxes, laying out your prints, changing inks and the maintenance box, etc. I'll just quickly show you around the main parts and the, the features of the printer. This is the rear paper feeder. You can see it's fully extended up here. To the sides here are your edge guides, which you'll be adjusting in and out depending on the size of the sheet of paper. You'll note if you've ever used earlier Epson printers that the sheet is in the middle now, whereas it used to be over to the side with just one edge guide. You now have two that are centered here. This is the printer cover. Underneath here are all of your inks. So when we're changing or replacing the ink cartridges, you will be opening this from time to time. This is the main control panel, and it's a touch screen, so it's really easy to use. We'll look more closely at that in a second. This is the output tray. You can see I've got it fully extended as I push it in here. This whole assembly goes behind the front cover Okay, so this is what it would look like as it's all closed. So with the output tray open, it's like this. The front paper feeder is tucked up inside here and normally you'll be working from the rear paper feeder with most kinds of paper, but for very heavy poster board or thick media, you'll use the front feeder, which is here. And it also has center edge guides right to guide the paper through so normally you'll keep that closed so this is the normal position that you'll be working with the printer um, to the right on the front below the control panel this is the maintenance bo maintenance box cover and occasionally you will need to replace the maintenance box which collects the discharged ink this is the printer control panel the main power button is here the menu under here contains all of the settings. And as it's a touch screen, you can scroll up and down like you might on a smartphone. So all of the settings for the printer are under the menu, but across here also are shortcuts. For example, under the information button at the far right, you can see the supply status, which is in this case uh, showing all the ink levels as well as the maintenance box. Again, the, the maintenance box is uh, the container that catches the uh, discharged ink as it's uh, uh, not been, been used. 
Uh, so the ink levels here are quite a lot more um, uh, more detail that you're getting here than maybe from the, the main screen here, right? So with this printer control panel, as with a lot of computers and software, you may notice that there are several ways to accomplish the same thing. So across here, all of these buttons effectively are shortcuts to things that you may find under the menu anyway, okay? But some of these are intended to be uh, operations that maybe you would use more often. Uh, for example, under the maintenance shortcut, uh, you've got printing a nozzle check, uh, doing a power cleaning, uh, forcing the paper to feed, things like that under maintenance, right? So it's probably a good idea when you're just starting to work with this printer that th this is one thing that's probably worth looking in the manuals and the help documentation and learning about what are under all of the menus. And as you work with the printer more, you will start to remember uh, where the different things are. So here's maintenance again. And again, it's just exactly the same information as what you get from this shortcut up here. Now you'll note in the center here, it says the type of the paper that's currently loaded. Whenever you load a new sheet of paper into the printer, it will ask you what kind of paper and also to uh, select the uh, which tray and the paper size and all of that. And that happens automatically when you're putting in new paper. So traditional photo is uh, one of the built-in uh, types of paper that uh, are in the printer's memory. So I've selected that. Um, and then after you, you load the paper, then it'll say what's loaded here and the size of the sheet. With the latest models of printers from Epson, you'll find that you have multiple ways that you could connect the printer with your computer. You can use Wi-Fi or Ethernet, but even so, your best option is still to use a USB cable. This is simple and provides the fastest data transfer and also reduces the chance of any data errors or problems that can arise, for example, when you're printing over Wi-Fi. Besides, I'd always recommend that you're right next to the printer watching as you're making prints anyway, so you might as well use a wire. This is a USB type B connector, which goes into the back of the printer. You can also tell that it's USB three by the blue plastic insert. To connect the USB cable, open the side cover, bring the square end of the USB cable round underneath and connect it into the printer. The P900 also supports connection over a Wi-Fi network as well as an ethernet cable. All these options are described in detail in the online manuals and documentation. And last but not least, I print a nozzle check at the start of every printing session. So here I have just a sheet of plain copy paper. Actually, you can see this has already been used. I keep uh, discarded or um, old copy paper just to use to print my nozzle checks on so I'm not using good paper. So I'll just load this in the rear paper feeder. Uh, the printer control panel now is asking me to choose the paper type. So I'll choose plain paper, bright white. Uh, I'll put in the paper size as A4. Okay, click OK. So paper type, paper size is all good there. Now I'll go into maintenance and click print nozzle check just to confirm. So now it's printing the nozzle check. You'll want to look at the printed test pattern in good light. And if you're like me, put on your reading glasses or use a magnifying glass. And you want to check that there are no gaps at all across the entire printed pattern. So you don't want to see any missing lines. Now this is a good pattern. After it comes out and you've looked at it, then on the printer control panel, you'll have to answer whether or not if you see any uh, breaks in the lines, if there are any uh, lines missing, then you will click here in order to run a cleaning cycle. Or if everything's okay, as this is, they all look clean, then you click here that says that we're okay. So that is the nozzle check finished. Repeat the cleaning and nozzle check cycle up to four times, and if it's still not perfect, 
let the printer sit overnight and try again. If you still can't print a perfect test pattern at this point, you need to contact Epson support. Now, if your printer sits for any long period of time without doing any printing, the head can get clogged. This happens because the nozzles dry out with tiny little dried bits of ink, and this creates blockage. So for this reason, I make sure to do a nozzle check every single week on each of my printers, even if I'm not doing any printing on this machine. And again, I do a nozzle check at the start of each printing session as well. Now that we have our printer set up and ready, we need to get our computer connected to it. Depending on which computer and operating system you're using, your options may look a little different. I'm using Mac OS Big Sur here. But regardless of which computer and operating system you have, pay special attention to the names of the settings and the sequences of steps because they will be the same regardless of your operating system. With a couple of notable exceptions, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Anytime you start working with a new printer, one of the first things you need to do is install the driver. Now this is a very important point. Depending on your operating system, you may very well be able to connect to the printer and start making prints just using the built-in drivers in your operating system. Don't ever do this, for a couple of good reasons. Firstly, drivers are always being updated, and you always want to make sure to use the most recent printer driver. Secondly, if you use the built-in drivers instead of Epson's, you're going to miss out on a huge number of very important controls when it comes to making the best quality prints. You always want to be using the Epson official driver software. So the first thing I'll do is open a browser window and go to epson.sn. Now this is a new website that provides more automated ways to download and install software for your Epson printers. Type in the name of your printer model. I'll just put P900 and it shows here in the list. Click the search button. This loads a page for the printer. I'll click setup and then in the setup window click here to scroll down. Now there are a set of tutorial videos. If you click the play button down here at the bottom right, these videos show you all the basic setups for unboxing, unpacking your printer. I'll just skip through these quickly. Ready for the next stage. Click for more and click download. Now the download has started. I'll go to my downloads folder. Click to open the installer. Double click to launch Install Navi. Skip through the security questions. Accept the license agreement. Now the software will check to see if it finds a printer attached. I don't have the printer connected yet, but I'll Click to connect via the USB cable. I will connect the cable to my computer. And once it's connected, the software finds the printer and proceeds to download and install all of the software for this specific printer. You can include or exclude any of these by checking and unchecking, but I just install everything. Now the installer will go to the internet and download everything that's required. Installing the printer driver itself. Now this is an important step. It's asked me if AirPrint is what we want to use. We do not. Never select AirPrint. Always make sure when you're given the choice that you choose Epson. Some final checks. And the setup is completed. Now I'll just uncheck for the online registration for now. Click Finish. I'll go to my System Preferences and in the Printer's Control Panel I can see that the printer has been installed. Alright, so we've got the printer set up, 
We've got it connected to the computer. We've got the driver installed. There are just a couple of other things I like to do just to make sure everything is ready. Over here, if I click Open Print Queue, you'll see that I'm asked again, do we want to use AirPrint? Never do this, so just click Never Upgrade. This ensures that we'll retain the official Epson driver. Now if I click Options and Supplies, you can see some of the other utility software that comes bundled in the print driver. This is a good way to check the communication with the printer, because all of this is updated in real time. Part of the driver package includes a utility, which creates a live connection to the printer and can show you all kinds of information and statistics. Checking the printer utility can be a really effective way to confirm communication between the printer and computer because things like ink levels are updated in real time. So now our driver is installed, the printer is set up and ready to use. To make great prints, along with the printer driver, we use another little bit of software called a printer profile. The printer profile describes the characteristics of the printer along with the paper that you're using. Now this is our first real introduction to color management, which is a crucial aspect of the print workflow. Your computer uses a color management system, or CMS, to translate the colors from each image, depending on the printer and the paper that you're working with, to keep the colors as accurate as possible. We do this through the use of profiles. Now, these are often called printer profiles because they do describe the way that a printer handles color values. But it's key to understand that a profile also describes the paper or media characteristics, such as brightness, optimal ink density values, etc. Especially when you're making your own prints, using good quality printer profiles is absolutely essential. So Epson, along with the print driver, provides collections of printer profiles, each specific to the printer and the media that you're using. A lot of media profiles come pre-installed with your printer driver, but there's a vast universe of other profiles that you can use, depending on whether you're using Epson media or a third-party paper. Now you may notice that I interchangeably use the terms media and paper, and sometimes substrate. All of these mean the same thing. Essentially, we're just talking about the actual material that you're making the print on. All this talk about media and profiles naturally leads to a deeper conversation about paper and media types, which we'll talk more about in a moment. And we'll dive deeper into color management and using profiles in our next video. But for now, let's conclude our conversation about the different software that you'll need to use to make great prints. To make a print, you use a software program on your computer to send the print job to the queue. In other words, you can't just take a digital image file and put it directly through the print driver. You need a host application set up for printing images. The most popular and common of these is Adobe Photoshop. Historically, I've printed the majority of my fine art photos using Photoshop. Adobe Lightroom is also a great choice, especially when you're printing multiple photos at once. Epson Print Layout provides all the essential controls you need for printing photos, whether it's just one or many, in color or black and white. For many photographers and artists, Epson Print Layout can be the perfect solution without needing any other software for printing. We'll cover all of these apps in our next video, but for now, let's return to our discussion about papers. In photographic printing, one of the areas providing the greatest potential for personal expression is in your choice of substrate. And by substrate, I mean whatever paper, canvas, fabric, metal, acrylic, whatever is the material that you're actually doing your printing on. Like many fine art photographers, I've found that every photograph has its best potential paper. As an example, some images might look great printed on a high gloss paper. But a semi-gloss, or a luster, paper is actually the most versatile choice. Images with a very arty feel to them look fantastic on a fine art paper with a matte finish. Photos of water and reflections can look amazing on glossy paper because the character of the paper surface itself is a good match with the content of the image. 
So you want to choose your substrate with consideration to the theme, the mood, the subject of your photograph itself. You'll also want to choose your paper depending on whether you're printing in color or black and white. The more seriously you find yourself getting into printing, you may also find that your tastes and preferences for papers evolve as you gain more familiarity with the available options. For now, it helps to simply think in terms of photo papers and art papers. These broad characterizations will serve most of your needs when you're choosing the best paper for a given image. Now, photo papers are the ones we're all familiar with from years of having photos printed at a lab. They come in finishes ranging from matte to super gloss, but one thing they all have in common is a very sort of slick feel to them, kind of plasticky. Fine art papers have a very different feel. Whereas photo papers can sometimes feel very plastic and synthetic, fine art papers feel more natural, organic, and soft. You can get fine art papers in a range of surface textures from very, very smooth to rough and dimpled like watercolor paper. Also, as you might expect, different papers and other print media have different characteristics in the way that color is reproduced. Some papers are maybe brighter white than others. Others maybe have a little bit more of a yellowish cast. Still others might have a slightly red tint or green, etc. For many photographers, choosing paper is an art unto itself. And with all of the options, at times it can seem a little overwhelming. If you're just getting started for now, it's enough to know that you have a broad range of choices when it comes to paper. And if you've been printing for a while, maybe it's time to try some new paper options. Now aside from the surface and finish of your print, the other very obvious characteristic is the size itself. You have actually two sizes to consider. One is the sheet size, and the other is the area of the live image. The live image area describes the photograph itself, or the boundary of where the ink is actually laid down on the paper. Most of the time, I make my prints to include an unprinted paper margin all the way around. This serves several purposes. First, it makes the print much easier to handle and reduces the risk of damaging the live image by touching it. Prints with ample margins are a lot easier to handle. Second, if you're planning to mount or frame the print, having margins unprinted makes this a lot easier because you can attach tape hinges, corners, other adhesives without uh, running the risk of damaging the live printed image. Printing with margins allows the full image to be shown without the risk of being cropped or cutting, cut off by the edge of the paper. Also, when prints are loose like this, having margins makes for a much nicer experience of viewing the print because it creates a, a border around the live image against any background area. And lastly, making prints on a sheet using unprinted margins means that your live image area is not at all constrained to the aspect ratio or the size and shape of the sheet of paper. For example, this image is two by three aspect ratio on an A3 sheet, which is a different proportion. You could print a square image on a rectangular page and so forth. Although I very rarely print borderless, sometimes there are exceptions. There are cases where having the image print all the way off the edge is the right solution. And the Epson P900 and 700, like most Epson printers, do provide for borderless printing. But they understand that this does come with some limitations, most notably around the aspect ratio and the shape of your image and how that relates to the sheet of paper you're using. One of the key decisions you'll make on every print is how the live image is positioned on the paper. Epson print layout is designed precisely for this purpose and makes it easy to place the image on the paper however you like. It's a little tougher in Photoshop, where your image size and rotation, along with the settings in the page setup dialog box, as well as on the main print screen, all combine to determine how the image is actually placed on the page. 
Over the years, one thing I've learned the hard way is that when printing from Photoshop, it's a good idea to rotate your image so it's oriented in the same direction as the paper's going through the printer. This means rotating your image 90 degrees to match your paper orientation before opening the print screen. You'll get some strange and frustrating results if you try to use the page setup options to rotate your live image on the page. Instead, if your paper sheet is going through the printer in portrait orientation, but your image is in landscape orientation, simply rotate the image 90 degrees first before opening the print window. This will save you all kinds of frustration. Lightroom is a little easier because it gives you direct control in real time while you can see what you're doing. We'll work more on page setups and using the print screens in the next video. Now let's talk a little bit more about a couple of key characteristics of paper. That is its thickness and weight, and relative to that is its flexibility or stiffness. The Epson SureColor P900 and the P700 provide several different ways to load media. Your choice will depend mainly on whether it's a roll or a cut sheet, but also how thick the paper is. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a few different ways to load paper. The most common that you'll use is the sheet feeder here. So this is the, the rear sheet feeder. And so you adjust the side edge guides to hold so that they're not too tight. You want to make sure that there's still just a little bit of you know, wiggle room there on the edge of the sheet. Again, when we look at the control panel then, it'll ask us what's the paper type. This is traditional photo paper. Now it does show recently used papers, so traditional photo. Importantly here too, we also have to put in the paper size. And this is something that you will have to remember to do. Uh, this is A3 paper size. So when I'm done with that, click OK. Now this sheet of paper is loaded and ready to print. So the other way to load from the front of the printer is down here, the front loading tray. Now you'll generally be using this with very thick and heavy papers like poster board, maybe some fine art papers. Now with previous printer models, it was very common that even a, uh, a fairly um, you know, moderate weight fine art paper that you would need to feed through the front. You'll find that with this current generation, the P900 and the P700, that many of these papers you can actually feed through the, the rear feeder. But I'm going to be using my uh, sheet of traditional photo just to show this. We'll set it sort of in the middle, and then as I push the edge guides together, then we get it so it's just touching and just a little snug. Now it's important whenever you're loading paper that you keep an eye on what the printer control panel is telling you. So it's actually asking me, it says, the front paper feeder is open. If you load paper, select the paper type. So it, it gives you options, fine art thick, disc tray, this is for printing CDs or poster board. I'll just go for fine art thick. Okay, so then the printer is preparing itself internally to switch over the paper feed path. Now it says load paper with the printable side facing up and push it in. And I'll just push it in far enough so that it, it will catch. Click complete. Now I'll click the paper size. I need to check that it is A3 paper type. I'll keep it on velvet for now. Click OK. Now we'll push to close the front paper feeder and it's ready to print. So this has been just an overview of your basic setups and preparations for printing. In the next video, we'll look in more detail at setting up your print jobs and working with software. Thanks for watching.